So yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Julio Sad Rodriguez. I'm based in Heidelberg at the university. And uh, yeah, I'm the first uh, speaker of this workshop. And so as uh, um, you've heard, so we'll get over, you'll go over different topics this week. And, and the idea is that I will give you a bit of an introduction of general network-based ideas and approaches to look at biological data and then in a kind of a first half and the second half I'll show more specific uh, work from, from ourselves. Um, and before I start, actually, I wanted to check a bit to get a sense what, what is uh, your background, because I think it's heterogeneous. So just to get a sense, so who would say they are, uh, let's say, mathematicians? And uh, biologists? It's a very good distribution. <laughs> OK. And who has already uh, built a differential equation model? OK. Who has analyzed, let's say, transcriptomic data? Wow. OK, so everyone knows a lot of everything. This is good. So we will see how, how it goes. I, I really like that uh, I think many people answer the questions to several, raise their hand to several questions, which means almost a lot of interdisciplinary people already. So yeah, to start with, um, about different data and technologies, and, and this is something you, you, you will hear more, I think, in the next talk by, by Christine, but just to, to set the scene. Uh, so there are different type of biological data that uh, we can use to, to profile the cells. And uh, we can look at proteins in the cell with proteomic or modified versions of protein with phosphoproteomic. We can look at metabolites with metabolomic. We can look at RNA. Uh, with macroarrays or RNA sequencing more uh, mature or more uh, newer technology. We can look at the genome, at specific mutations like SNPs, and at different uh, type of, of sections like the exon sequencing, the part that is coded, or the whole thing. So, the, so there are different types of omics technologies, and as I said, you'll hear more about this in the, in, in the next um, presentation, but what I, I, I want to also make a, an important point is that uh, all, of this all of this type of data are really uh, entangled. So we, we tend to think about layers in biology, like uh, gene expression, which will be looking at RNA and transcriptomic, or metabolism, looking at, metabol at metabolites or the metabolic enzymes, signaling. But these layers is like some. Uh, framework we use to try to understand what's going on, but in truth, it's all entangled. And I think it's quite important to keep this in mind, whatever you do in terms of analysis, that if you have only one type of data, you will only have a slice of what's truly happening in a cell of interest. And what's really remarkable in terms of technology is that our capacity to measure all this type of omics data had advanced enormously. So this is uh, for the case of, of genomics. Uh, very uh, dramatic, so this is the, the cost of, of sequencing a genome, and this is logarithmic scale, so when the first genome was sequenced 20 years ago or so, it was 100 million, and now it's under $1,000 to sequence uh, a genome. So this is for the genome, and the other type of omics data are maybe less uh, cheap, they're still a bit more expensive, but they're all following similar trends in the sense that we are able to look at uh, more and more, and in a cheaper and faster way, at the different omics type of data that you can think of for cells. And this has opened venues to, to do many type of, of research, from basic biology to ecology to human disease, all, all the way to, to find new treatments. And how we try to go about uh, uh, to use this data, so a very common framework, and something that many of, of you or of us uh, probably work on, is to try to use some type of algorithm uh, that try to extract uh, patterns of this data. So whatever you have, transcriptomic, proteomic, or combinations of those, there are algorithms from statistics, machine learning, or now deep learning, which is a very uh, trendy that you try to use to extract uh, from this data uh, patterns that maybe uh, associate your data of, of that you're looking at with something that you're interested in, like a phenotype or that you can use them to, to predict. 
And uh, I will not talk uh, much about machine learning algorithms. It's something I think also you will uh, hear from, from other presentations. Uh, but uh, I, I will try to talk a bit of how we, we use machine learning and, and what we need to do to make machine learning more um, efficacious. So for example, the research that we do, which is uh, related to human disease, is to try to use this type of omics data to, to understand disease and to find which drug we should give to uh, each patient. This is what is called personalized medicine, how we assign a drug to a patient based on molecular data. And we work in oncology a lot, but also in other type of diseases like cardiovascular or autoimmune diseases. Uh, and uh, it's always really this question, how can you relate molecular data to an outcome? And the outcome is whether a drug is going to work or not in our case. And in particular, we work a lot on this question using large screens of cell lines. This is around 1,000 cancer cell lines that are screened with 400 drugs. So, so you have for each cell line and each drug the effect of the drug uh, on, on the cells, so you know how much drug you need to kill a patient. And here, the question is then, can you identify in the molecular data genes or other features that best predict the drug response? And what uh, came out of the analysis is that if you simply input your data into your machine learning algorithm and basically run it, uh, no matter how advanced is your machine learning algorithm, the predictability is really is very low, so it doesn't work as well as we wished. And even more important is that interpretability is also limited. So you may find a gene or a group of genes that are associated with, in our case, drug response, but the same would hold for other type of machine learning but you don't really know what that means and why that is in, uh, important for, for, in this case, the disease you are looking at. So this is one reason to try to use different types of biological knowledge, like networks, or more generically, things that we know about biology, to help this uh, approach. And the idea is that instead of trying to look at 20,000 genes or thousands of proteins or hundreds of metabolites, whatever you measure, you try to extract from these large data sets a smaller number of features. This can be uh, different signatures that I will discuss later, uh, that then is what you can input into your statistics and machine learning model. And there are two reasons to doing this. One is you reduce dimensionality, so you have less features to look at, and then this means statistically you have more power to find associations. Because the main problem that we typically have in these studies is that we have more features than samples. So you have 20,000 genes, but 1,000 cell lines, you're in a bad situation. But instead of 20,000 genes, you have 10, 20 features. Maybe you can find more associations with your output of interest. And the second, that uh, if, if these features are based on biological knowledge, like pathways or other networks, then they are interpretable. So we don't get maybe a list of genes or a linear combination of genes that we don't know exactly what it means biologically, but it's then something that is connected to biochemical process so we can interpret it and maybe we can use it also to come up with new experiments. So far so good? I didn't say it, but of course you can interrupt me anytime, any questions you have, okay? Did I say anything you did not know? Okay. So, so where does this, where do we get this biological knowledge? If we want to study data to, to extract different type of features. So there are many places where you find this knowledge. Uh, you can even yourself go to papers and see like in reviews what is known about pathways or other cellular processes but there are also a lot of databases where people have curated a lot of this knowledge. And these different databases, they typically come from different places, they have different motivations, maybe they were looking at some biological context or they extracted from different type of evidences. So then there are also, let's say, meta resources that they try to integrate from different places uh, information. So if we think of biological networks, uh, very, well known one is string from Perbor's group at EMBL, Pathway Commons uh, from Chris Ander and Gary Bader for Pathways or Consensus PathDB from Berlin, PCNet from Trey Idekar. So they all have different focus, but the idea is to bring together 
many sources of biological knowledge that then you can use for your downstream analysis. We also have developed our one, our own, which is called OmniPath. And again, what we try, like the others, is to combine different sources of knowledge. So here is different type of, of information, for example, protein interactions. So we put together, or we connected 44 different databases, uh, uh, regulation of, of transcriptions, so transcription factor and target genes, or ligand receptors and different things. So what we did is uh, to put all of this into one place is simply to facilitate the use. Then if you have if you're doing your analysis with R, you can use a Python pa uh, bioconductor package or Python or directly from, from Cytoscape if, if you look more networks. Are you familiar with Cytoscape? Okay. I just don't know. I think people know everything, so I could, we could skip most of this. Anyway, but what, what was important for us, and I think it's something uh, to keep in mind, whether you use Omnipath or other resources, is that um, it's important to benchmark whatever information you use. And in our case, what we spend a lot of time is to benchmark different resources because they'll always tend to have different trade-offs. So some resources will give you uh, little information but with high quality because they're very curated. Others will have a lot of information but less curated. Or they maybe are very focused on cancer or they're focused on uh, different context. So it's important to have a sense of the value of different resources and a bit like, you know, if you, if you go to the ophthalmologist to, to try to find the right lens for your glasses, so we always try to find the best combination of resources to answer the, the question at hand. Okay, so that's just to say that there is different places to get biological knowledge. Now, uh, how we, I wanna go back to the data and I, I thought to start with a very basic example and motivation of why we need to do this use of biological knowledge and pathway or networks. So maybe the simplest experiment that you can think of, and I asked before, so many of you have already looked at transcriptomics, so you probably faced this before. You have your experiments, you have two conditions, A and B, cancer, no cancer, or knockout versus wild type. You have done transcriptomic, you have looked at differential dispersed genes, and I'm interested in the learning biology, so what probably want to know is which biological processes or pathways are involved in this difference between these two experiments. So now what I could do is I could say, okay, I'm gonna check um, uh, which genes are altered, and if I look at this gene called MAPK1, and I look in some of these resources I saw before of pathways, KEG, which is one of the very best known ones, not necessarily the best, but one of the best known ones, so I can see that this map kinase one, which is the regulated my experiment, is involved in many different processes. So I could say, okay, this means uh, that maybe all these pathways are important in my experiment, or, or, or maybe not, maybe only some of them. And, and the question is, how can I find out this? Anyone knows how to do this? If I have pathway, if I have an experiment, two conditions, and I want to know which pathways or processes are Different between these two experiments, what would you do? Gene profiler. And what does gene profiler do? Enrich, exactly. Gene sets. Exactly. Right? So this is very classic functional analysis with bioinformatics, and there are two ways of doing it, the enrichment and the representation analysis. So the the Maybe we start with the, this one because it's simpler. So you will have your gene set, as you say. So you look at all the genes, for example, in a pathway or all the genes uh, connected to uh, apoptosis or, or, or some biological process. And you will see of the genes that are changing in your experiment of interest or the one you're looking at, how many of those are in these gene sets versus outside of the gene sets. And you try to see if there are more in that gene set that you would expect by chance, meaning that the process as a whole is more involved in, in your experiment than by chance. And this is the simple, very simple statistical test, but it has the limitation that you need to decide where to threshold your genes. So the alternative, which is probably more popular, is to do some type of enrichment analysis where you don't need to put a threshold, but instead you look at the genes in the gene set and you see if there is a trend uh, uh, so if these are the genes in my experiment, the, the black arrows, uh, uh, 
I see if, if they are more towards one of the ends in, in my experiments, if they are more over, higher, or, or, or more lower than randomly split. So okay, this is very standard, this is what we all do. Uh, but there is one thing that I, I want to mention because I think it's quite important, which is that um, we need to think carefully how, how we use these gene sets. So let's say I'm, I am interested in signaling pathway. Signaling is also, in my own research, what we look most at. And I have here my, my pathway of interest. And if I have RNA, I would say, okay, I will look at the RNA of these uh, blue dots here, right? And this will tell me if there is more RNA, my pathway is more active. Okay, that's what I would do now. But what, what are these blue things here biologically? Proteins, exactly. But that there is more RNA, does it mean that there is more protein? No. And that there is more protein, does it mean that it's more active? Not necessarily, right? So when I look at genes, I have to be careful in how to interpret them. And maybe it would be more useful, instead of looking at the components of the pathway, to look at the transcripts that are downstream of the pathway. So if I know which genes are controlled by this pathway, if I look here, this will tell me more about the activity of the pathway. And this we call footprint of the pathway and allow us to better determine the activity of pathways. And, and this is important because what can happen, of course, biologically is that if you stimulate this pathway, then some genes will be altered in their expression and maybe they are in this pathway, but maybe they're in different pathways. So when you do classic enrichment analysis on gene sets, you may find actually indirect effects. So many times, you see in papers that people say, oh, we found higher activation of this pathway, but that doesn't mean that the pathway is more active. It's only that the genes are more expressed. And sometimes even is a compensation mechanism. Like if this pathway is very active, let's say there is a mutation here, you may actually see that the RNA levels are down because the cell is trying to compensate for a hyperactive pathway by pushing down the genes. So I think this is something important to, to keep in mind when doing this type of analysis. And so based on this, we, we have a tool which is called Progeny, which allows you really to estimate pathway activities from the target genes uh, down here. The limitation is that you need to have that knowledge. So you need to know which genes are downstream of, of the pathway. And in our case, we did this by curating a lot of experiments. And you need to have a lot of experiments to derive robust signatures, which means that you cannot do this for all the pathways. So in our case, we do this for around 15, 16 pathways. But for other pathways, we don't have these signatures. So you may need to look at the genes in the pathway, but again, keeping in mind their limitations. And a similar idea can be applied to estimate the activity of transcription factors. And we develop a resource called Dorothea for doing this, where what you do is that instead of looking at the expression of transcription factor, you look at the expression of the target genes. And you see if uh, these genes go up or down, this means that the activity of transcription factor is going up or down. But if you look at the expression of the transcription factor itself, it may not change or it may change in a different direction. So one question. Yes. What is, the, what is the requirement to do in your research using progeny? And for example, that even pathways association that you find normal in dates or you find in care? I'll show you a couple, it's a good question. I'll show you an example in the second part. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you will see, like, there is some overlap indeed in the genes. Uh, but some are different, and so this can affect downstream results. And in our case, we found that we find, for example, better association with drug response than uh, with the classic methods. I'll show you this in the second part. Yeah, but yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, but don't be shy. Um, okay. And the other thing I wanted to mention, because now there is a lot of single cell data, which is very exciting, but it has a lot of uh, limitations or, yeah, problems. For example, when you do single cell RNA, you don't measure all the genes. There is this called dropout, so you get maybe a few thousand genes, and there is a lot of noise. And so what we also check is how well these methods work for single cell RNA, and actually they are quite robust. And the idea is that if I want to know if the transcription factor is active, as long as I have enough transcripts down here, I will get enough signal to estimate the activity of my transcription factor. And of course, this at some point will break if you have too few or too much noise, but they are reasonably robust to this type of data. And the same idea holds for other types of omics data. 
So if I have photoproteomic data, what, what type of thing do you think I can learn? Protein activity? Yeah, exactly, right? So if I have also proteomic data, I can estimate, for example, kinases, and but it's the same idea. I don't look at the phosphorylation of the kinase itself, but of the target gene, uh, proteins, and then I can estimate kinase activity. So I, I'll finish this part just summarizing uh, what I was trying to say, and, and we really try to think about this uh, as, as footprints. So if I want to know if a process is active, is often the most informative to look at what it does downstream, if it's a kinase and phosphorylation, if it's a transcription factor on changes in RNA, uh, but it can also be like a macro RNA, then you, you, you want to look at the target genes as well. And as long as I know these black arrows, as long as I know how my process of interest affects what I'm measuring, I can use it to estimate the upstream uh, component. Okay? Any question? Okay, this is now um, functional analysis, but I think these are important ideas for uh, all the other things uh, I will talk about. Now I wanted to talk a bit more about actual networks, which is, on the, of course, the, the title of the course. And uh, so, actually, what is a network? Uh, there isn't, no, just say, well, you can say anything. A network, is a gene set a network? A list of genes in a network? No, it's genes plus nodes that are connected by edges. Okay, nodes that are connected by edges. I can agree with that. Okay. So network is node connected by edges, uh, which is good. And what type of networks do you have in biology? Do you, have you seen any network in biology? Or outside of biology? No? Signaling? Signaling networks, yeah. At the back, ah, huh? gene regulatory, yes, protein, protein, second, metabolic networks, very good. Okay, exactly. There are many different types of networks, right? And they all share this idea that you have nodes and edges, but they describe very different things. And uh, also very important is actually there is not a network in the cell. So if you open up a cell with a microscope, don't expect to see nodes and edges. So a, a cell is a mess, okay? It's molecules in kind of a soup or maybe with some structure, some uh, organelles and so on, but it looks like this. So there is no network. So a network is an abstraction we do computationally to understand or to interpret or to visualize what happens in the cell and the data. But don't forget that, so this is very important. And what type of networks they are? I think you said most of, of the types I also thought of. So one type is protein interaction networks. So simply, each node is a protein, and the interaction is if a protein interact. Signaling networks, these are typically sparser, smaller, but have a bit more of detailed information. So you have also proteins or other type of molecules involved in signaling, and you have edges that tells you what does a protein do. So this protein activates this one, and, and so forth. There are metabolic networks, also you, you said this. These are normally very large with a lot of biochemical reactions. How one metabolite is transformed in the next, and so forth. Or even we can infer networks from large data sets, like typical gene co-expression networks, where each node is a gene, and, and the interaction is how correlated are two genes. So here does not mean necessarily that genes are physically related at all, simply they are co-expressed. And why would be two genes co-expressed? Anyone works on this? Because they share a common regulatory basis. Exactly, so if they are shared by a, a common regulation, they will be, go up and down at the same time, but there could be two proteins that if you go to the protein interaction network, they're really far. So they are all networks, but they, are, they tell us different things. And as I said before, the underlying theme is that they kind of share a mathematical description, graphs, nodes and edges, but they can be metabolites, proteins, genes. The arrows can mean a physical interaction, can mean a regulation, signaling, can be many different things. And uh, there are other types, uh, for example, binding of track to targets, Ecology, not a completely different scale between organisms. 
we are some sort of network, right? Each of one could be a node, and maybe if we know each other, we have an edge, for example, from before. We will not talk about the coronavirus, but <laughs> you can see this. Um, okay, but so we have these networks, and then what can we use them for in the context of data? So very similar to what I explained before about these gene sets of um, pathways or, or footprints, we can use the networks to overlay our data and extract different subnetworks. And these networks, uh, there are many, many methods to how to identify them. I will just not go into the details. I will only show you an example, uh, which is a bit old, but this was one of the first ones that did this quite nicely. So what they did in the study here uh, was to, to take gene expression and map it on a large protein interaction network. And so they tried to identify submodules, so a group of genes and edges connected in the network that best discriminate, in this case was ovarian cancer, and they were trying to discriminate uh, metastatic from non-metastatic um, patients. And I will not get into the details, but the analysis is very similar to what we discussed before about the gene sets, of how you do for enrichments and things like this, it's very similar. And then what you can do with, uh, what they could do in this study is to identify subnetworks like this one here with these genes that was better predicting uh, or discriminating metastatic from non-metastatic patients than looking simply at, at individual genes or at goal terms, which is purely list, but you do not have this knowledge or concept of the network. So, so the fact of, of having the network and, and kind of building into the equation that some of these genes interact with each other help them to, to find better, uh, in this case, classifiers of, of disease. But also remember, as I said before, in the context of the gene sets, we are mapping gene expression to proteins, and as we said before, this is an approximation, so again, this also will not be perfect. Yes? Any question? What's the difference between the gluon purple curve? Uh, so I need to remember, uh, but I, I think this, yeah, I, I, I will check later, but I think this is where they had two studies, so two data sets of patients. Okay. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll double check later because it's been a while, but I think they had two studies of patients, uh -huh. and actually I, I said ovarian, but it's breast cancer, it's two breast cancer studies. And they saw different performance. This is there under the curve, but similar trend. So go and MCBV are two gene sets. Uh, and these are best markers, and this is random, and this is the subnetworks. Yeah. They're a good question. So don't be shy to ask, yeah? I don't buy it, I don't give you a grade. <laughs> so we're here to learn, no? So just showing you figures, you, you can do this at home, so please ask. So one question regarding these two, because I discussed last year with Beno, one of the others, yeah. who said that we should not use that with RNA-seq data. Uh, that's a good question. So wh what I know is that, but it uh, does, doesn't have to do with RNA-seq. So this first study was done with some heuristic that is not very efficient, and there are actually, you can use uh, linear programming, there's something called Bionet that solves the same thing more efficiently. But about RNA, so it's why? Because it because of the counts? He said that it doesn't scale and that the model is not good to use. So I didn't have time to dig into that. Okay. He said that the model is not good and that we should use other tools. Yeah, so we use, we don't use this one. It's only the, was the first, more or less. But this is one called Bionet, which is a bioconductor package, and that works quite well. And okay. I know there are even more. I mean, there is now all these methods. Well, you know, of course, all the diffusion and all these things you, you can apply. Uh, but, but you don't know why exactly you said that. You have I mean, what I, what I know is that the method is, indeed, it doesn't scale up well because it's heuristic, so you need to simulate a lot to make sure you find the right solutions and you have good distributions. Um, this I know, but I don't know if there are other aspects involved. Yes? How does it compare to uh, diffusion-based methods? Let's say, oh, you know more than Model, they implemented, in decades, they implemented two version, one with simulated RNA, and one with a 
Ah, this one is fine, I can see it. Chrome is also applies green search, I think. In their search, they put a node in between two jumps distance. Mm -hmm. And again, a grid, as far as I remember. Okay. And uh, compare some example nodes. Uh, maybe the bottom of you can. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always different, like if you have very strong solutions, you will find a very strong solutions, but if you have, otherwise it could be a bit different. The, the problem is, uh, as I always talk a bit about that, that you, depending on the tool, you can find very big clusters, very small ones, a lot of small ones, one big, and, and then it changes the parameters. It's very hard to benchmark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on a little bit with cutoff points. In Arctic okay. Network Search, they never measured for it, and they stopped regrowing the network at some point. For Run Walk, also, you can do it if you are doing implementation. So I think they can, depending on the threshold that you use, the method that you use, they can find similar things. Great. But also, Run Walk is more on answer. No, 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 we are all here to learn. I'm learning from you, so go on. It's better for me, so. But still, it's more, it's, it's more depends on the connection. If it has a connection, it can jump to that. But in our memo, if it's uh -huh. more connected, then it has more chance of getting a signal. Very good. OK, great. So we can talk more later. So next is that this method, they only use the, the network, so whether the nodes interact. But we often know, it's particularly related to signaling, there is some direction, right? So, so we know that maybe you know, this protein affects this one, but not this one. This one is the other way around. Chic is the one that affects MAPK3. So then the next step is, okay, can we use that knowledge somehow to, to, to maybe get more out of the data, not of the network? And so one way is to try to reconstruct pathways that link key proteins using something called causal reasoning. And the, the basic idea is very simple. So imagine I do have such a network, so I have nodes as before and edges, but now my edges have a direction, so I know that it's A to B, not B to A. And if I'm lucky, I know the sign, so I know the effect is positive or negative. And so I can use some sort of reasoning to try to find out which pathways are connecting things that are uh, happening in my data. So if in this simple case, I see that when this is active, this one here is active, and I see you know, there are three possible paths. So which one is the one connecting them? Top, medium, or low? So let's say who thinks is uh, top? Medium? And low? Okay, no one goes for low, which is good. Why? Because there is a negative connection. So if this were the right one, when this is up, this would go down, no? Because this activates this, this snippets this, this activates this. And I think there were more for this than for this. Uh, and uh, probably the truth is that they both could be right. Uh, but we typically, or very often, we try to go for the shortest path, the simplest path, which again, biologically, one can argue whether this makes sense. And there are ways to, to kind of work around this. But if you feel like the simplest is the more likely Occam's razor uh, principle, then you would go for the upper one. Uh, but if not, maybe you could leave them both as possible solutions. And, uh, and what is nice is that these type of problems, you don't need to do them by hand, or, or even with heuristics. There is uh, also linear programming that you can use, so integer linear programming to solve these type of questions, given a very large network and different types of uh, experimental data. And yeah, and there is software that solves this for you. And, and, so, and so we also, and there are tools from, from others, but we also try to use this approach. So we develop a tool which is called Carnival, which does exactly that. So if you have data, say transcriptomic data, and, and you know which was your input, you try to find the paths that connect the input of your, of your experiment, let's say the ligand that you put to bind to a, cell, to a receptor or a drug, to the stream changes on transcription. And if you have other data, like kinase or something in between, you can also use it. So simply it's a way to combine uh, different types of omic data by biological networks in a causal way. And this is in a bit more of detail. So you will start with a large 
sign a directed network. So we use this resource Omnipath that I mentioned before to build this. So you would estimate activity or transcription factors with a tool I said before, Dorothea. You can estimate the upstream pathways with the tool Progeny. And using this linear programming, find the model that explains the data. And normally you will not find a single model because the network is really rich. So you have many different ways to explain your experiments. So you will get family of models, so different ways to explain the data, and then you work with that family of models as a solution for um, your, your question. And so to, to compare this a bit to the other approaches that we saw before, there is a trade-off. I think anyway, whenever you compare computational methods, there is always some trade-off. In this case, is that if you go for the pure network mapping, uh, you need less biological knowledge, you only need to know who interact with whom, you need to know whether it's a direction or a sign, which you will need for causal reasoning. In that sense, they are more flexible, you can do more, uh, use more things, more data, because you, you, it's simpler, but arguably you are less accurate in what you find out. But it's a bit depending on the question at hand. So far so good? Now in the, in the last part of the introduction, I will switch gears a bit to talk about other type of approaches that you will also learn about more in the course, which is dynamic mechanistic models. Uh, and uh, I, 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 to introduce it, I will, or to push it in the context of the things we just saw, I'll, I'll kind of take again a step back to the beginning and a bit come back to things I said before to place these dynamic models. So if you have data, data mining, uh, data that you want to mine, so the simplest thing you could do is to use pure statistical methods, like you could cluster the data, principal component analysis, and so on. This is a descriptive uh, interpretation of the data, but it's purely data-driven. You don't use networks, you don't use biological knowledge. But you know, for some questions, that's perfectly valid, and actually it's normally, anyway, something you should do the first time you have some data, just to look at it in a pure data-driven way. So until now, I discussed some ways to use biological knowledge, networks, or transcription factors, or other targets, or other things, to also do some descriptive analysis, to just look at the data and see what's up or down, but using network or other type of biological knowledge. And, and this is nice, and, and we saw now this uh, carnival, this way to find even causal links. Uh, so this is kind of a way to, to interpret your data nicely, but it's not something that I can use to predict things. So now I cannot say, okay, if now I come and I put a, a drug here, or if there is a mutation here, what's gonna happen down here? I cannot do that with these methods because they're purely descriptive. So I need to move from descriptive approaches to predictive ones. And again, this predictive model, I can do it in a purely data-driven way. Machine learning, statistics, linear regression, tons of methods. Or I can try to build a, a predictive model based on a network formalism. And this, this is where this dynamic model fits in, which uh, again can, comes in different flavors, can be discrete or continuous, and can be based on a causal description of the model or on a biochemical description of the model. And I will elaborate a bit on this now. Uh, but basically, just to place dynamic modeling in the context of other computational approaches, network-based or non-network-based. So there are different ways to do these uh, network models. And uh, as, as I said, described before, there is always a trade-off. Uh, and in this kind of summary of some methods, uh, as you go from left to right, you have more refined models. And this by no means complete. So there are other ways to, to even be more refined than this one's here. And as you are more refined, you, you can learn more. But you need more data, more knowledge. It's more complicated and it's scale up worse. So the ones I will talk a bit more now, and it's also what we do most, is uh, logic models, which also come in different flavors. There is very powerful tools based on ODEs, kinetic modeling, that I think you'll hear more from Eda and Jana in a couple of days. Uh, but some of the basic ideas uh, are similar. But yeah, but today I would like to talk about logic models. And uh, the first thing is maybe to, to understand this difference between logic model and kinetic modeling. So if you want to describe a biochemical process, 
Uh, a very natural way is to write down the reactions, right? Uh, biochemistry reactions, like in chemistry, and convert them into differential equations, which I think from what I asked at the beginning, most of you are familiar with. Uh, and this is very good, but if the network is large, uh, this will not scale up well. You have a lot of parameters, you don't know the, the value, or you need to feed them from data, your ODS becomes huge, they will not simulate. So for large, if you have thousands of proteins or hundreds of proteins, this will not work really well. So the idea of these logic models, and in particular the Boolean models, which is the simplest form of a logic model, is to, instead of looking at the reactions, think of each, each protein as a node that can be on and off, one or zero, and they are connected with logic gates. And these logic gates and, and or, or gates. There's a very simplified description of biology. We abstract from the biochemical reactions. It certainly is not right, but because it's simple, it scales up well. And the information is almost what you have in these networks, in these maps, just with a little bit more of insight. So you have two kinases that phosphorylates and activate another one, junk here. And if you know that any one of them can activate the kinase, this is an OR gate, because one or the other activates the target. If you have two proteins that need to bind to make a dimer, like STAT1, STAT3, they need to make a dimer, it's an AND, because you need one and the other to get the active form. And uh, if you have um, a, a, a negative effect, you can also take care of that. So you have a kinase and a phosphatase, and there is a, another kinase, AKT, that is only active when one is active and not the other. Then, as I said, it's an AND gate. This is very simple description, but it scales up uh, really well. And just a slightly more advanced uh, example, so you have a kinase of, a cascade of kinases, in this case the map kinase cascade, which is three kinases. If you want to do these Boolean logic models, all you need to do is one variable for each of them, and you have then the, the AND gate on the top. But if you wanted to do reactions, you will need to write down uh, all of these reactions here, which are 11, and for each of them, you will need to write down the kinetics. You have parameters, and for each of these nodes, you have an ODE. Then, of course, you can get much more uh, insights. You can look at difference between high and low effects, continuous changes, but uh, it comes with a price in terms of the, the size of, of, the, uh, of the model and all sorts of complications. Okay, is it clear? I mean, there are people in the room that know more than me about logic models, but uh, I hope the idea is clear. So then, what we use logic models for is to train them to high throughput data. So we take data where there are different conditions and readouts, a generic network, again from Omnipath, where you have sign and directed interactions, and we have some tools that basically train the, the network to the data to build these logic models. And as I said, because they are simple, they'll scale up well. And uh, uh, so one thing that I think it's also, I will come back to that now in a moment. So a logic model in the simplest form and the most common form is Boolean, is discrete, but you can also derive from a logic model continuous variance, and I will show you that in a moment. Uh, yeah, and, and this can be applied to different types of data, proteomic, uh, metabolomic, and, and it doesn't matter so much. Maybe I'll skip this. But just this idea that uh, a, boole a logic model in the simplest form can be Boolean, and you can look at steady states or, or, or uh, time series data, but you can make it quantitative using things like fuzzy logic or probabilistic logic, or even you can derive differential equations out of a logic model. And all approaches have pros and cons, but the generic a trend is that the more complex so the logic ODE is, you can get more detail, but you have to need a smaller model to, to be able to work with it. And in our case, we use this tool setting up to, to go from one formalism to the other. So normally, for example, you would start with the simplest Boolean model because it's easy to train to the data, it's easy to, to understand what it does, but it may not answer all your questions, then you can refine it, or you can take a part of it and, and refine it in more detail. So with that, I'll finish this general uh, part of, of the presentation. So 
as we've seen, using biological knowledge in the form of networks or other type of um, knowledge. Uh, it really helped us to look at large omics data. It increased statistical power, but also interpretability. Uh, so we think it makes sense to consider data as a footprint of the process of interest. This can be more informative. Something I didn't get into details, but I, I believe it's really important to benchmark these methods. So sometimes people run methods on data, but we don't really know how well they work. And it's hard to have good uh, benchmarks, so to really assess how well a uh, method really works, I think it's really important. And uh, yeah, how the network-based approaches can integrate the individual genes or, or features like transcription factors. We look a bit at this idea of mapping the data on the network versus this more causal type of uh, relationships. And finally, these dynamic models that uh, are a complementary view where you don't just look at your data or visualize it, but you can build models that you can ask them questions such as what happens if now I new the experiment, if I, I have a knockout or I block something in my network. Okay, so that's the first half. I hope it was helpful. And I thought we can make a very quick break of a couple of minutes and I'm here if you have more questions. Thank you.